Um, thank you all for coming. And this session is on um, effective advising using Datatail. Uh, we've got our two experts in the room, so it's always good to see Jamie and Jamie. Um, they uh, definitely have been great with facilitating questions and answers. And as always, we are recording these sessions. We are live streaming to Harnett and to Pittsboro. Um, so if you have any questions, please feel free to ask, but wait till um, they are ready for questions because a lot of times there may be something that's being answered you know, as we continue on with the session. We are um, recording, so just be mindful of that as you're talking to the neighbor beside you. You may be, um, what you're saying may be picked up on the microphones. This session will be available on my Blackboard site. Um, probably I'll have it up by the first of next week. So if anyone was wanting to attend and couldn't, tell them to go to HR slash PD um, on the Blackboard site and select uh, Professional Development on the left-hand side. And this is the 2015 Professional Development Training Series. That is the first tab you will see. Um, without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Jamie and Jamie and we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks. Good morning. Thank you for coming to see us. <coughs> We have a lot to cover in this session, so we may have to move through it kind of quickly, but we welcome some questions at the end. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Jamie Steffler. I am Dean of Admissions. Jamie Childress, Dean of Enrollment, Registrar. Okay. And so just to go over the agenda that we're going to do today, um, there are two different advising workflows that, um, depending upon if they're a new student or a returning student. Uh, new students, obviously, we are advising more of admissions up front. So we go through the application, having them get their transcripts in. Um, do they have any transfer credit from those transcripts if they come from another, another college, another institution? Do they need to take placement testing? You know, do they need to apply for financial aid? Um, making sure they attend new student orientation. And then, um, obviously, we get them registered in data tell. For a returning student, they would have done all of that. Um, so you're looking more at performance, progression through their program of study, looking at their schedule, their workload, course sequencing, registration, and then how are they making payment? Are they using um, the deferred payment plan? Are they using financial aid? So I'm going to go over the new student approach where Jamie's going to go over more of the returning student approach. And so when we get a new student into our office, we need to start asking them some questions up front to kind of see where they want to go. Uh, so we ask some basic questions about their interests. Um, we ask them their progress through the admissions process. Course registration, do they want day? Do they want evening? Do they have childcare concerns where they can only do some course scheduling during certain times of the day? Um, and do they want online? Do they want seated? Do they have a preference? Uh, if, um, how do they intend to pay for, for their classes? Are they going to apply for the Pell Grant? Are they a veteran using VA? Um, are they going to use the Workforce Investment Act? Is their employer going to pay? Um, are they going to use a different payment plan, which is FACS? Um, or do they have um, a special program grant that they're going to qualify for? And so that's not an exhaustive list, that's just some examples of how they can pay. Um, and ask if they have some special needs. Obviously, we have some students with disabilities coming in to take classes, and so making sure they're accommodated through our special populations department. Um, students coming from out of state may, may ask, well, what kind of housing do you have around your area? And do they qualify for any TRIO grants, like the Veterans Upward Bound? I might go over just the first three, which is like interest, your progress through the admissions process, and more of the course registration pieces. Um, so as far as interests are concerned, when you go into Datatel and you go into ASUM, which is the applicant summary, you can see if they've um, put in an inquiry into the system, and we've covered the inquiries through some of our other trainings we've had, but you'll see if you bring up an ASUM and you see a PA status, that's something that they've inquired about. They haven't applied to the program yet, they're just inquiring about the program itself. And then we ask them about their interests. What do they like to do? What are their skills? What are their abilities? Um, what are their career goals? Transportation, can they get back and forth at campus? Computer knowledge, do they know how to operate a computer? If they don't, they may not want to take online classes. Are they comfortable using a computer? Job demands, if they work third shift, they want to take something at night. Uh, so we um, also look at if they've attended other colleges. If so, 
what did they take there that may transfer in here to get them into our program a little bit more quicker and get them um, back out to the workforce. And it's always important to get the students started in the correct program from the very beginning. Because there are some financial aid limitations. They have 12 semesters of full-time held to use during their college career. Um, that's including if they're going to transfer to an upper level institution. So it's important to get them started so they're not wasting that financial aid money that they have allotted to them. And also, you don't want the student to waste their time and their effort. They come in and they're very excited to get started. And if they're looking to change in the midst and knowing that some of their classes they haven't taken previously will go into their newer program, that kind of loses their momentum. You want to keep the momentum going so they're excited every single semester for their classes. The admissions process. <clears throat> uh, you can see those admission steps through CRI, and I'll go over that in a little bit. But they want to um, put an application for the college, and we'll go over how to look at that as well through SACP. They need to have their official high school transcript on fire or their high school equivalency, as well as college transcripts. Now, college transcripts don't need to be requested unless they want us to review college credit. But the only exception to that is if they're using veterans benefits or if they are pursuing a health program of study. They have to give us those college transcripts. <coughs> And then also placement testing. <coughs> so in order to, for a student to receive financial aid, all of those steps must be completed. So how can you tell if a student has a current application on file? Um, you can go to the SPRO screen and see if they have it, but it's a little bit nicer look to see it in, all in one screen. So if you go to SACP, when you put that in, you'll get the, this first screen. And just know from our previous trainings, we said that continuing education and curriculum records are in one student record. So you really want to be careful as what you're looking at. Then this is a good example of it. That first one is basic skills. And so when you see that A, that means that student is active in that program. But you know basic skills is not on the curriculum side. Um, but they're still active. They could be taking, you know, a course through basic skills and or through continuing education and curriculum at the same time. And then here, you know, electronics engineering, they are active in that program. And then when you see that C, that means that that's something that they've changed out of. That's not an active program for them. So when you see, say for instance, if that first one was aesthetics and the second one was cosmetology and there was two A's, that means it's a double major. Um, how can you tell, you know, if it's a double major? If you, if you click into one of those, you'll get this screen here. And so down here where it says primary academic program, it'll say yes. The other one will say no. That's how you can indicate if it's a double major. But also this tells you the catalog that you would need to be advising under. Um, because catalogs, you know, requirements of programs change with each catalog. So you want to make sure that we're advising out of the catalog that the student is under for that program of study. And then also, their semester start date. So all of that can be seen from the SAP screen. And then also, if you don't see any active programs, um, that's an indication that they need to put in an application and get their active program declared. This is the CRI screen. This is where you can see what admission requirements we received, what has left to be um, submitted. So here you'll see, for this student, placement testing has not been satisfied yet. Um, they haven't gotten in their high school transcript, um, and they're still lacking one college transcript. But we received the UNC Chapel Hill transcript on December 1st. So that's how you can see what is left for the student uh, to be submitted as far as admission requirements are concerned. A little bit about placement testing. Uh, who needs to test? Um, essentially, is anyone that has <coughs> English, math, requirement within their program of study, or um, a good example, um, if they have like the education classes, um, if they use an English or a math as a prerequisite, we would still need them to test unless they're bringing in something that would make them exempt. And those testing exemptions, as I just said, um, they would not need to test if they're transferring in an appropriate English or math class that would make them exempt. They can go right into those courses in the curriculum if they're bringing in advanced placement or articulated credit. 
uh, and if they've had acceptable scores in the last five years, SAT, ACT, Compass, ASSET, um, other AccuPlacer, um, some of the older tests, um, we'll accept that within the last five years. And so how do you know what's an acceptable test score? On the placement testing website, we have, if you go to required scores, we have a grid of, okay, if it's a math 110, which test is it and what score do they need? So that's how you can indicate what's the acceptable test scores. And this will be changing for fall because we have different math classes that were um, coming into play in fall and we're deleting some and plus we have some score increases for SAT and ACT and we have different um, AccuPlacer tests now. So this will be updating um, for the fall semester. And multiple measures. This is something effective for our fall semester. Any student coming in with a new application um, this is a state policy that uh, we'll be considering their unweighted cumulative GPA from high school in the last five years. They have to have a specific math course, um, and we can also consider SAT, ACT scores in the last five years. Um, if they meet that waiver, um, they do not need to take a placement test. And um, next month, we'll be doing another session that goes further in depth into this multiple measure. So we really encourage you to attend that. We had instituted a new, <coughs> excuse me, uh, placement <coughs> test uh, beginning of March. Um, we know, we've been on the diagnostic math for about a year, and now the state uh, required us to go to an English diagnostic test. This English diagnostic test took the place of what we were doing as far as reading comprehension and sentence skills. So our new diagnostic English encompasses two different sections. Um, they now have to write an essay, so they write places in composition, 300 to 600 word essay. And then they're also taking a reading and revising section, which is 50 multiple choice. And so they're reading for every one of those 50 multiple choice questions. And then the math, there is no changes to that. It's still taking you know, 10 through 60 for 72 questions. And so the scores from that, those two diagnostic tests, it's a little bit different than what we were seeing with the reading of the sentences. The reading of the sentences was two separate scores. Um, that's not the case for the NCDAP English. With a weighted combination of the essay, the reading and the revising sections, it gives you <coughs> one composite score to place a student. So you're no longer looking at, well, what's the reading score? What's the sentence score? It's, it's very nice, actually, to, to just have one score you need to look at and know how to place that student. And then the modules for the math, uh, they range, the scores range from 1 to 12, with 7 being proficient. So if they're needing you know, 10 through 40 and they get a 7 and 10, then they would, we'd have to take that 10 module. Jamie, how fast uh, can the right placer be graded? Artificial intelligence? It or? is. Okay. It's immediate. All right. About 8 to 10% of the time, we'll have a score pending come back. And College Board actually has a human reader on their side score it. We've been getting those scores back less than 10 hours. Okay. So it's actually fairly fast if we get a score pending. And our placement tests are put onto our TSUM screen. And the TSUM screen um, encompasses a lot of information. Um, you'll see in the very top, the admissions tests, um, the transfer credit for math, transfer credit for English. That's what those exemptions will mean is we brought that in. Um, you may see advanced placement or CLEP. Um, then the middle part, you'll see our older AccuPlacer, the arithmetic, the elementary algebra, the reading, the sentences, SAT, ACT, Compass, ACID. You'll see all of those scores in the middle section. And then the bottom section is where you'll see the diagnostic scores, or if they've taken mastering reading or mastering math, um, or if they've been a, a career and college promise student, they see plan or PSAT. Uh, all of those scores will be in the bottom section. And 
And so when we are entering in scores on a T-sum, that equates to equivalencies on the stack screen. And so for instance, you'll see um, if a student was proficient in the diagnostic English, you'll see a non-course credit here for 96, 97, 98. That means that they do the English diagnostic test, they tested in the English 111. Um, same thing with um, this student. They were, had proficiency through 10 through, um, through 60. And so that equates to they can take Bath 171. Uh, and so that's kind of how you can determine from here, you know, what non-course credit they have. Um, and then also, you'll see here, the Psych 150 up at the top, that's transfer credit. So if we're bringing in transfer credit from another institution, you'll also see it as a TR, transfer credit, on the stack screen. So you, stack will give you a wealth of information as well. Course scheduling for a new student, <clears throat> we use the curriculum guides a lot, as well as check sheets from the different departments. And so as an example, this is for a motorcycle mechanics student. Um, say they're coming in for the fall semester. And we've asked them, you know, you're looking at day, evening, um, what time frame are you looking at? So um, as an example, what you'll do is you'll use, I use SNIT to look up my particular courses. I actually plan a schedule before I go into the system and actually input it. So in SNIT, you'd put the term, the course prefix, and then the um, course number. And then the result of that would be, it gives you all of those courses for that semester. And then you can click in a little bit further to see this behind the screen, um, days, times, who's teaching it, how many students are enrolled in the course already. And so that's a little bit about the SMIN and how we go about course scheduling for a new student. And then once I have gone through SMIN and have has a, a good course schedule for the student and now everything matches as far as times and days, um, you want to go into PERC. Every student is going to have an advising hold on them. And what you'll need to do in order to register that student for that day, you'll have to backdate that advising hold PERC. You may see a lot of different restrictions, registration restrictions on that PER screen, but the only one that you're about two you can only remove would be a probation hold um, or an advising hold as an advisor. But you always want to backdate it one day. Um, that means you can register them that day that you're assisting the student. If you end it on the day you're assisting the student, you, you wouldn't be able to register them for the next day. So that's why you want to backdate it one day. And then once you save out of the perk screen, <coughs> you go into RGN, and RGN is where you do all of your course registrations. And so when you go into RGN, you want to make sure that your fall is your current term, because that's where it's going to pull all of your courses from. If you had, if you're registering a student for fall, and you had summer listed there, it's going to pull all their summer courses, which is not what you need. Um, so say for instance, if this was summer, to get to the current term, in that first line, you put in the term that you wanted, so that it defaults to the term that you need. And then you put in uh, the course, and um, then you would obviously submit it to actually print out the actual schedule. But what the admissions counselors do is after we're done registering a student, we'll go into student remarks, which is STRK, and we'll put down what we've done with the student. Um, and then that loads into a viso, where as an advisor and success coach, you can see what the counselors have done with that student. That way there's a link that you can see as far as advising is concerned. Um, that what we've done with the student. And I'll let Jamie do well, you students. We're going to zip through this because there's a lot of screens yeah. on this one. You know, as the student comes back, we want to really establish that right relationship. <coughs> and we want to get to know our students so that we can keep them engaged. So we need to ask some questions about them from them about their current load, their progress. Um, do they have some extra time demands that maybe they weren't thinking about when they first signed up? Um, are they still engaged? Do they have specific needs? Are they still liking their program? And then, of course, how they're going to pay. Okay. So we've got a lot of mnemonics within DataTel that will help you 
when you're talking to the student and to help you have that conversation. Now, Jamie's already gone over a lot of them. These are listed on a cheat sheet on the intranet, okay? The link is there, but if you go to the intranet under helpful files, under registrar, and it might be duplicated under advising, these cheat sheets are available, okay? Now, when you're starting the conversation with the student, okay, what's your current life? You know, sometimes our students don't even remember the name of their classes they're in, okay? I'm in that, that business class. It might be human resources, okay? It might be accounting, who knows? So, the easiest way to check that through Datatel is either through STSC or SCHD. STSC, next screen please, will give you a visual, okay, of what the student has. If you actually want to print it out, then you can go to the SCHD and then export it and print it if you'd like to. Now, Aviso is another tool. We're talking about data to tell today, but Aviso, you could both see their current schedule and their performance. Now, remember that performance or their current grade is what the instructor has entered in Blackboard. You know, it's only going to be as up to date as the instructor is in putting those grades in Blackboard. Okay. Yes. Can I just add really quickly, uh, they've modified it to under the current term tab that at the very top you can actually, uh, right below that, Jamie, you see the text box there? Mm -hmm. You can actually drop that down and it'll show what they're currently registered for and if they've dropped any courses, you can select the current semester and drop and it'll show you all the classes they've dropped for the semester as well. So yeah. that might open up another conversation of, okay, what was going on with these classes right. here and why did you end up dropping? That's good to know. And you, you know, we've had an inordinate <coughs> amount of transfers this semester. Um, Amanda can her. Okay. <laughs> had a lot of transfers. And behind the scenes, that, that looks like a drop ad. So if you didn't know what was going on, you know, that would show dropping and adding mid-semester of those classes. So that's good to know. Yeah, I was playing with it a little bit a couple of days ago. I was like, oh, we have a different look now. You know, <laughs> so I'm playing because I don't use this. I use Datatel all the time. Um, but the key to this is to have the conversation with the student. Oh, yeah, I'm doing great in history. Well, no, not quite. <laughs> And, well, yeah, but that's, and it could be that it's only one assignment and it could be the point balance that the instructor has set up on the Blackboard grade sheet too. So you've got to keep that in mind, but it kind of gives you an idea. Um, another way to see their progress through their program is actually by looking at their evaluation. I live and die by the evaluation, okay? That's how we're setting up our programs to ensure that students are actually completing the courses they need for their degree or credential, okay? So when you go to eval, E-V-A-L for student evaluation, you want to make sure that you set the parameters so that you're including courses in progress. I prefer the view of single column report. You want to be able to see the footnotes. Do not, do not use completed or all here. It did not used to be a problem if you changed this parameter. Financial aid is now forced to use it. You're gonna throw them all out of whack and you're gonna throw the student's financial aid out of whack. Use I, okay? Otherwise, I'll have to take that mnemonic away. <laughs> okay. So if you want to set the, if you want to print it out, which is a good tool for when you're doing a graduation application, if you need to provide a check sheet, Attach the student's evaluation. We'll go to the next one. All right, so here's an example of a student's evaluation. The evaluation will also show you the student's catalog so that you can advise them correctly. Financial aid is also looking at that catalog. They before only had, the only way they could verify that the student deserved to receive financial aid for the courses taking were eyes on paper, okay? We are now using the system if that class is not in the student's program of study, financial aid will not pay, okay? So this is gonna tell you the catalog. We've had a lot of catalog changes lately, so you need to be aware of that. It's also gonna tell you the student's program, and it's going to tell you their program GPA and their cumulative GPA. This student doesn't have one because she's in her first semester. We go to the next one. 
This one has a GPA. Here we've got a 3.289 and his <coughs> overall, oh, is also a 3.289, okay? But it gives you a nice look of, oh, I'm missing a course. It's real easy to see what the student needs, okay? It's not entirely foolproof, but it's close, okay? <laughs> so, if we go to the next one, I think we've got one more. You can also use old school planning guide check sheet, okay? Now, this is advantageous if your student is in a cosmetology degree program, but they're trying to get the certificate after their second semester, okay? because they may never have been listed in the system <coughs> as a cosmetology certificate, so you won't be able to pull an eval on it. But you could use the check sheet, okay? So, this one is kind of an, it's an older AA. AA is a little more challenging, and AS, when you run that eval, sometimes DataTel will double use classes. You gotta be careful with that. The system office is aware of that, and they're trying to work on that program. But you want to make sure that you're using the appropriate check sheet. This one was updated in August of 2013. Obviously, there will be a new one that's come out. There are program planning guides. Can we go to the next one, please? This is a program planning guide off the website. There is one for every program of study up there. It's up to that department to keep that updated. Are they all perfect? No but we're working on it, okay? Some departments have their own. You know, back when I was an instructor, I took ownership of the check sheets for all of the engineering department, okay? So we had it on a one page. I had one for every student that I could write down their grades, when we're planning on doing this, you know, when they took what, okay? Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm rolling because I had like three times the number of slides she had, okay? Um, okay. So, if you don't know the student's catalog and you can't do an evaluation because they weren't in that program, I had one the other day that was a, has been nursing for five years and wanted to get her associate degree and they couldn't do an eval. It's like, mm, no, she's not in associate of science. So, that being the case, if you don't know the catalog, you can look at the catalog as Jamie shared by either going to SPRO or and drilling into SACP, or you can just go straight to SACP. Okay. Now, as we're having that conversation of how's your progress, how you doing, hmm, Johnny, you withdrew from your humanities, but you needed that humanities. I know you're gonna retake it, but oh, you gotta have a social science too now. And so now you're gonna be maxed out the following semester. Or, well, I understand you know, the English 111 was just too hard online, <coughs> but you've still got to get in 114. And next semester is supposed to be your last semester. You do understand that this has probably extended your time with us, right? You want to have those conversations. Now that we've got eight week options, we might work something out, right? Okay. You also need to know that so many of our programs, we're not a huge school. We're good size, okay? But we're not huge. We are not Chapel Hill where we can offer 20 sections of the same class every semester, okay? So many of our programs build, okay? And we're trying to ensure that happens even more with our stackable credentials. So you need to know that, mm, you haven't taken circuit analysis. You know you can't take analog or digital until you do that, right? And they're only offered in the spring. So pretty much you're spinning wheels till next fall when you can get circuit analysis that you dropped. Okay, you need to keep that conversation open. Um, we've gone through a lot of curriculum improvement projects lately. We're, we're so big on acronyms, just, not just our mnemonics, but acronyms, CIP, CIP Curriculum Improvement Project. So all of engineering, transportation, all, most all of the Vote Tech classes went through a super SIP, green SIP about four years ago. We just had the math SIP, which has affected every program we've got. 
And we're not always clever when we do things in mass at a higher level. So <laughs> we've got different courses with the same name and they have different prereqs or co-reqs, okay? This means on your evaluation sometimes, you can see a student took Math 121, but it's not fulfilling the requirement. It was a different version, okay? So we have to manually make that adjustment. All right, so know that different versions can have different prereqs with the math SIP. The old Math 121 needed DMA 10 through 50. Now it needs DMA 10 through 60. Okay, next slide please. So, here's the example of the 121 that has, man that's fuzzy, that has different prereqs now even though it's labeled the same thing. Okay, next slide please. You can find out about your requisites at the state level by going to the combined course library. Okay, we've got a link there. It works just like our search on WebAttend you do the same thing, okay? You can look by course or subject. That's only going to give you state prereqs though. We are actually allowed to put local prereqs on as well. Now our local prereqs should be listed in our catalog. Again, our catalog is kind of like our planning guides. We're trying to get it fixed, okay? But there have been some errors, so be aware in your area exactly what the changes are. Um, you'll notice I did a snapshot of Math 121 out of our 2013-15 catalog that's online, but this is the old version of 121. Starting fall of 15, it's now gonna to have to include the prereqs of DMA 10 through 60 there rather than through 50. Okay. Okay, as we're talking to our students, you know, the average age of our student is 28, okay? I have had a 17-year-old and a 67-year-old in the same class, okay? And it's sometimes challenging to handle that broad spectrum in a teaching environment, but not in a one-on-one -on -one advising, okay? You kind of have to know where the student's coming from. Are they still living at home with mom and dad? Or are they working that second shift job and supporting wife and three kids. Okay. Now, sometimes students really think they can juggle and they really can. So, this is a good time to have those conversations. Sometimes it is a good idea to spread it out for the student. I'm still good with three years. If they can do it three years, I'm still good with that. Okay? Federal iPads recording is still good with three years. <laughs> We're good but we want them to complete. So, it's always good to say, uh, you know, did you start working? Or they finally turn 21. Sometimes that'll be a life changer, okay? You have to know your student and be able to discuss those things. Okay. okay. You want to also look at, you know, some of our students just don't do well online. And we tend to say, okay, we can fix this issue where you drop the class and now you're going to be off sequence, but we can fix this because we can get you in an eight week online. Yes, if the student is motivated, but if the student's already dropped a couple of classes, is that indicating motivation? Okay, so we've got to be able to light that fire or realistically discuss the issue with the student saying, you know, how do you do online? Do you have the time to, to complete this course? in eight weeks because remember it's the same material in half the time okay same material half the time and you have to be independently motivated to get on there and do it because you're not in a classroom okay so conversations to have okay. now another way you can look if something major has happened you know, we Students don't always want to open up with us. If you're in a program where it's a very small cohort and you're following them through, you tend to know them better. If you're in a larger program where you may not see them, like college transfer, you may not know your students as well. But this can give you an indication, you know, this student had a 
really bad semester, okay, last fall. This was the semester GPA, okay. Previously, okay, we had a, a B plus average, okay, A minus, B plus. Mm, looks like we might have withdrawn from some stuff here. Here we had a, a strong C, okay. Something's happened with this student. You know, another point to have a conversation. But you can see, I like stat to see what is, what's the history of the student? Is this typical, okay? And you can see that in a snapshot, whereas you can't see that from an email. Great tool. I'm not here to tout Avisa. I'm telling you about Datatel. But, okay, once you have had this discussion with your student, okay, your advisee, then you can say, okay, I don't know your schedule. You go pick out your classes. Send me your plan. I've told you what you've got to have. Here's your planning guide. This is what you need to take this semester. Submit it to me. I'll approve it, and then you can register yourself through WebAdvisor, okay? Um, don't remove that advising hold, okay, until they submit the plan. That's the goal of a visa. We may not all be there yet, but that's the goal, okay? So, great way to empower your student to take responsibility for their own schedule. Okay, so Jamie spoke to you about registration again. On your personal restriction page, you can remove an advising hole or you can remove a probation hole. You can't remove any other holes. I'm sorry. Okay, usually it's because they, they need to give us something that costs money. Okay? Or they're we're in violation of some regulation. Okay? So if you're gonna remove an advising hole, remember to do it the day before you're registering the student. So you backdate it. If you're removing a probation hole, make sure. And I personally used to register students say, okay, you're in this ACA 090 class, okay? Not you have to sign up for it. You are in this class, okay? Everything else gets built around that class. Now, ACA 111, 115, 122 cannot substitute for 090, okay? 090 is below 100 level. It cannot substitute for 111, 115, or 122. <coughs> okay. Um, if the student is on probation for a second time, or a third time, or a fourth time, but at one point they completed ACA 090, you can check that on the stack screen. With a C or higher, they do not have to retake it. You can remove the hole. It's always good though to have that conversation. Mm, didn't do so well last semester. Mm, you only had 12 credit hours and. You really need 18 to stay on track. That's probably, we we'll probably need to look at stretching this out a little bit, okay? You don't want to overload the student with more hours because he did poorly the semester before. That's not what's best for the student. Okay, RGN. As Jamie shared, you need to make sure you're in the correct term. Um, I've got some faculty advisors who will just type in the term and let it pull up all the classes for the term and then close out of it. You don't have to do that. When you're actually entering the course, if this is blank or if it's the wrong term, start before you type in the course, type in 2015SU space and then the class and it'll pull it up for some. Okay? Okay. We sometimes forget Oh yeah, I gotta pay for this, don't I? Okay? And I, I don't know why I get the students, well, I was, I don't, my class isn't there anymore. Well, did you pay? <laughs> okay? I see you were purged for non-payment. Did you think you have financial aid? Well, no, I still gotta get them some stuff. <laughs> okay. Did you set up the payment plan? Well, no, because I got financial aid. Well, no, you don't yet. Okay, so I can register you. I really don't care how a student pays when I get, I can get them in class, okay? That's not my big thing from a records point of view. I want to register them, get them in class, get them there, okay? But 
or an advisee advisor relationship, it is important. Again, non traditional students, they're working. Most of them do not have mom and dad paying tuition. Okay? They're working and they're trying to come up with it. Over 50% of our students are getting some sort of financial aid. So, always make them aware of the payment deadlines. Only pre registration has a payment deadline. If we are beyond pre registration, they need to pay that day because you don't know when I might purge. Typically, I should be purging every day. I don't purge every day, but I should be purging every day, okay? So, yes. <laughs> I should be purging every day, okay? <laughs> so, Do your flims, okay? <laughs> okay, so open or late registration tuition is due at the time of registration. For summer, it is May 8th at 12 noon. Not five o'clock, not midnight, 12 noon, okay? And then for fall, it's gonna be July 29th. Um, we can't do it on the 31st because the business office always has to close out the last day of the month. Web advisor payment has to come down when they close out the last day of the month. And we need about four to five hours to process a purge. Um, fall tuition rates are not set by the state legislature until <coughs> July. We never know what it's going to be. But you can assure the student it won't be less than it was last year. Okay? <laughs> I mean, it'll never be less. I'm sorry. So you can look at the tuition rates, the table, and say, okay, you've got 18 hours, and here are your fees, or 17 hours. This is what it's going to be. All three of the classes are online at $45. So it's going to be about this, okay? So that they know. Recommend that they check their web advisor. I send out bills. I know that's that's a little incongruous, but I do. I send out bills every mid-July once tuition rates have been set. I run about 3,000 of them when we mail them out. That's the only time we send a registration statement. Students know how to check their web advisor account, okay? They can pay through their web advisor account. Once it's been posted, and typically we know by the 7th of July, we have rebuilt all of those students. So that 7th, last year, I think it's the 11th, before I run all those statements. But we know, but doesn't really fly when the student says, oh, I just got my bill two weeks ago. What do you mean you purged me? Well, <laughs> um, unfortunately, we're not one of those services you know, where we can't collect money, we have to collect it up front. It's, it's state mandated. Okay, students, to, co to earn financial aid, they've got to do the FAFSA every year. <coughs> February is recommended after you file taxes or parent has filed taxes. That's the big time to do the FAFSA. Um, I haven't ever seen them run out of money for students for com community college, but I know when my kids were at university, they said, oh, you gotta do it earlier, the money won't be there. Okay. I think it was my better. Anyway, <laughs> um, know too that most of our institutional scholarships, not most, but a large part of our institutional scholarships are need-based. So in order to apply for a scholarship here and complete that application, the student must have completed the past. Okay. And we don't do loans. We don't do loans, period. We don't do loans. No Stafford loans. We don't do loans. Okay. Their bank wants to do a loan, their bank can go do a loan, not a bank. Financial aid guidelines. We've got to have all of these things in order for the student to earn financial aid. They have to actually apply to the college and apply for financial aid. They don't have to apply to the college every year, but they have to apply for financial aid every year. Anywhere from a third to half of every applicant will be selected for verification. Right? Okay? Automatic. It's not something particular they did all the time. Sometimes it is, but not all the time, okay? Um, in order for them to receive financial aid and it to be released, we have to have an admissions application. We have to have an official high school transcript that shows they graduated. So all our high school seniors that are trying to send them now in March, 
their transcripts are going to be marked incomplete on CRI because they haven't graduated. <coughs> Okay. Once they graduate and I get a transcript that shows an actual graduation date, then we can mark them complete. They've got to have placement testing. Every associate program, every diploma program has general ed requirements in it, which means they need placement test scores. And then a handful of certificates. Okay. Um, the program of study has to be approved by Department of Ed to be awarded Title IV Pell money, okay? It's not automatic. It is a minimum of 90 days. Once a program has been presented locally at our curriculum review, then it has to go to Raleigh to be approved, okay? Then we have to get approval from SACS, and then financial aid can ask Department of Ed to fund it, okay? So, new programs, typically you're looking at a 12 to 18 month turnaround. You can't say, ooh, we're gonna have this new program that's gonna start in the fall. It can start, but you're not gonna have any students because there's no financial aid available for it, okay? So. Um, SAP, Satisfactory Academic Progress. For a student to continue to receive their financial aid, they have to successfully complete two thirds of their classes in which they attempt, okay? So, a W counts like an F, an I counts like an F, an R counts like an F, those are not successfully completed, okay? Successful completion, see or better. Okay, there is like an, I don't know, 60 or 80 page advising guide on the intranet. And I think I've updated the screenshots, okay? I think that was last March. <laughs> um, know that faculty advisors and success coaches, you will not be able to register students, okay, after the 16-week drop -ad, 16 week drop ad period is over, okay? In order for a student to not be financially impacted, when you are dropping and adding, drop ad period occurs after the semester has begun, okay, you've got to drop an ad, same number of hours in the same session in DataTail. Plus, now that we've got continuous enrollment, you can't drop a second eight-week class and add a late 12-week class and think there's going to be a, a financial wash. It doesn't work that way. They're getting charged 25% for that first eight-week and then full for the 12-week if it's still before the census date, okay? Day five is after the census date for a first eight week. They gotta pay 100%, okay? That's why I know it's, it's very, I've got a chart with dates for all my ladies. It says, you know, this, for this class, this, this class, this, this class, this, okay? Um, I think that was it. Questions, did I get through enough time with yeah. questions? Wow, yeah. okay. <laughs> Anybody have questions? It's a lot. It's a lot. Really? Okay. Um, there will be a multiple measure placement test in CDAF, which is diagnostic for DREs, um, and probably touch on DMAs also, now that 78, 80 aren't being tested. Um, April, like the day before pre-registration opens. Sorry, best we could do. We've had four this month, okay? <laughs> it's the best we could do. <laughs> um, 